Welcome to Wellness Radio with Dr. Jeanette Gallagher as your host. Her show discusses topics of health, wellness, and spirituality and is about discovering your place in this great universe from your cells to the cosmos. Along with her guest in casual conversation, she strives to ask the difficult questions that may be holding you back from a vibrant life and shares new ideas that may inspire you to make a change in your life that you only can see in your dreams. And now, here is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Radio. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher, and it's a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. Tonight, we are going to be talking about how we can transform our lives, how we can open the windows and the doors, how we can see our life for what it really is. Many of us have had so many difficult times in our life with challenges, obstacles, it seems like doors shutting in our faces, or name-calling, or throwing out, or casting out. And that sense of feeling of grief, of depression, of sadness, pain, and just plain taking you to your knees. How do you find ways to find the seeds, find the passion, the inspiration, or even the grace of a helping hand, a kind word, or compassion that can help you to open your heart, breathe in, and see another day, and have a life that was just was meant for you. My guest today is Dr. Tiffany Tate Moore. Her book is Flowetry, a collection of 108 po- poetic flows on life, love, and liturgical issues. Dr. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Good evening, Dr. Jeanette. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. I'm so glad to have you, you know, Dr. Tiffany, because don't you think many times people will say, but it wasn't the hand I was dealt. I don't know what to do with it. Or maybe I'm just stuck in this and this is the way it's supposed to be. Don't you think your book is truly about saying wherever you are, you can start there? I think so. I'm hoping that, you know, it will encourage people and let them know that no matter what comes their way, tomorrow brings a better day. Yeah, you know, I think also, too, is the idea that um, we say life, and just as you shared your personal story within many of your poems in your book, life, we think, is supposed to be this grand, epic kind of flowery, beautiful life and existence and everything's going to work out great. You know, we're kind of as babies given this beautiful little journal, you know, with all the pink and blue colors. Yet we turn around and all of a sudden something happens. It doesn't unfold that way. Do you think of that perhaps many people get very angry from the onset because it didn't unfold that way? I do, and I think it's okay that life is frustrating. And I think a lot of times we put a lot of pressure and stress on ourselves because we look at ourselves as a failure. And I think that society imposes all these rules on us, and we accept those rules erroneously, and we shouldn't. And I try to teach my children that failure stands for first, attempt in learning, and that failure really isn't failure, because if if there is a first attempt, there can be a second, a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and numbers are infinite, and because numbers are infinite, there can be an infinite number of chances, so you should never give up, and you should never stop trying, and that's the same with life. Yes. You know, it's so interesting, Dr. Tiffany, you share your story about your mother and your parents. And, you know, just as I've shared over many decades here on the radio also, the people that we really were feeling that would always have our back, that would always care for us, that would always know and do the best for us, and always be able to kind of like, I almost see it as um, they're in front of us and all around us and they're clearing the path so that we'll be protected and cared for. Yet, we look at it, and now in the year 2022, so many people are saying, let me tell you about my childhood. Let me tell you how I was raised. 
let me tell you all the pain and suffering I had. I don't even want to go there. But yet we do need to go there and look at how we were raised, what our story of our parents and a story of us as children. Isn't that important to actually start? Just as you did in your book, Flowetry, you need to start somewhere. I think it is a good path to healing, and it's a good path to growth. And when I look back on my childhood and, you know, my mother, she was instrumental and she taught me a lot. She caused me a lot of pain, but she also taught me many lessons. Um, You know, she struggled with drug addiction. She did not raise me. Her sister did. But she was there the whole time. Um, She showed me what resilience looked like because she was always in and out of rehab, and she never gave up on trying to overcome her addiction to drugs. And it took her a couple of decades to overcome it, and she eventually did. Um, And so, and even when she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and I had to go back and take care of her because I was her only child, it took a lot for me to forgive her um, because I was like, okay, Lord, you got to be kidding me. This woman didn't raise me, and she didn't ever take care of me, and now I have to take care of her. So I really had to have a lot of spiritual growth um, and forgiveness to have to go back and take care of a woman who never took care of me. And so she taught me a whole lot um, emotionally, spiritually, (laughs) um, just evolution-wise as a person. And so um, I think it's important to really evaluate your growth and your relationship with your parents. Right, because I think really going back to take care of her was God was saying, I'm asking you to do my work. I'm asking you to be the vehicle of unconditional love. I'm asking you to step into the place of being able to care for souls even when they can't care for themselves. Isn't that what he asked you to do? It was absolutely what he asked me to do. And and I did it. And I rose to the occasion. And it was a beautiful thing. And, you know, our relationship grew and it blossomed. And, you know, um, I held her hand as she as she transitioned. I actually sang to her um, as she died. And, you know, she had a peaceful transition. Um, and it was it was very beautiful because our relationship was a good relationship um, at that point. And she had given her life to Christ. It was it was beautiful, um, and so I have no regrets from that point. But you know, again, it it took a whole lot, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, from my my upbringing because when I was a child and when she was under the influence of alcohol and drugs, you know. She was verbally abusive. You know, she would be like, it's your fault that I'm on drugs and I ruined her life. And, you know, Mm -hmm. as a child, I just kind of internalized those things. As an adult, looking back, I know it was the drugs speaking. But as a child, I didn't know. But as a child, I would think, okay, I needed to be a better child. And so I turned to education. I was like, well, maybe if I was smart enough, she would love drugs. Um, less and she would love me more. So, you know, it ended up paying paying off because I ended up being smart and becoming a doctor. Um, but, right. you know, I tried to do all these different avenues to try to win my mother's love, essentially. Don't you think in essence what you really were sharing, too, when you went and you had more education and you became an OBGYN, weren't you maybe potentially saying, I want you to see how babies come out, I want to be able to birth more babies, and I want to give the gift to the parents. It's almost as if you stepped back and said, where did it all go wrong? And you wanted to keep repeating, like each time you would birth another baby, I want to see it, I want to see where did it go wrong, where did it go wrong, and kind of seeking just what you said your mother had put upon you. Where did it go wrong, right? Well, I just thought it was definitely a beautiful thing to to see how life came forth, you know, to bring life right. into the world, you know, to see how life comes from God into this world and to just deliver 
a baby and to be the first okay. hand um, to yeah. to deliver life. It was just a miracle every single time. And um, I just thought the miracle of life was just a beautiful thing, and I still do. Um, do you think you needed to reconnect with those feelings because perhaps they had been damaged along the way in your life? I do. I I really I really do. Um I think it it was um definitely uh the the miracle of birth um definitely helped probably it was ther- Don't you think it was therapeutic for you to heal your own heart? I do. I do. Yeah. I think sometimes we say the path we are on might be hard, but also, too, look for the other signs, what's behind us, you know, when we look back in retrospect, or what we say, perhaps, maybe, there's a different message here. And truly, every single one of your books in Flowetry is that retrospect, look back and say, ah, there's something else there, there's something different there. You could almost in your lifetime, probably write several sets of different poems along your path. One as you're in the experience, one as you're feeling pain and suffering from it, one as you're looking in retrospect, and another that says, oh, I'm healed from it. Yes? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, um, the miracle of of birth and passing the babies to the parents and watching the love um, is, is, is beautiful. I know that, you know, that receiving that from my parents um, is definitely a, a, an issue. And I know that I grew up with a sense of abandonment and I know I, you know, I still have okay. abandonment issues that I, I, I work with, I work through and I deal with now, even as an adult and I am fully aware of those issues um, mm-hmm. that I still have to work through. Um, the fact that I know that they exist <laughs> helps. <laughs> right. Um, That's absolutely. So, yes. I think awareness is the number one step. I mean, as soon as you you say, ah, something just pinged, something woke me up, something is showing up, and you say, oh, okay, that's it, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, knowing that that it exists helps. You know, they say it's not what you know that hurts you. It's what you don't know. Yeah. Do you think, Dr. Tiffany, too, you share many times in your book some several stories about abuse and about um, sticks and stones and about... um, It's not okay. I think that the world and humanity now in these years is truly coming up and uh, spewing a lot of anger, a lot of hurtful things, and we're kind of caught in the crosshairs. But is it coming up to be cleared? Is it coming up for us to see it and be in awareness? Or is it coming up because everybody else, too, is in this point of transformation? I think right now it's coming up because we are beginning the process to start the healing. And I think the only way we can start the healing is to start the discussion. And sometimes to discuss a problem, it can be painful. And nobody wants to talk about painful things. People prefer to bury their heads in the sand because people don't want to hurt people's feelings. People don't want to talk about things that are uncomfortable. But sometimes we have to push through the painful things. Like people don't want to talk about painful things. Like people don't want to talk about abuse. People don't want to talk about depression. People don't want to talk about suicide. But we know that those things are real. People don't want to talk about racism, but we know that those things are real. But, you know, people don't want to talk about those things. And so we just have to be willing to push through those painful issues and address those painful issues um, and 
as soon as we talk about those painful issues, we can get past them. It's you know, if you look back on it in decades, we used to hang out our laundry. Do you remember those days? <laughs> you know, yes. outside put them on the line. Yeah. <laughs> right, outside on the line and you know, people used to have their windows open all the time because they didn't always have air conditioning or heat or whatever. And you know, now we look at it everything has been even more so staying in staying in your home, staying in confined spaces um we don't want to put those things out there yeah we don't want to put those things out there because we don't want to be exposed that which is our inner being you know even with social media it's all about putting filters on your pictures you know or how can you paint yourself as whatever on there you know i've even seen things that People will send me a picture of their their photo, you know, for social media stuff, and it's like, but honey, you're 82 years old, and you sent me a picture that was 20, you know? And I think sometimes the idea is, is that have we gotten the perceptions wrong because we're creating a false sense of self versus being saying, I am worth it, I am enough. This is who I am in all my brokenness or whatever it is. I'm still whole in God's eyes. That is a huge story in your book, Flowetry. That's truly what you are saying. Yes? Yes, absolutely. And I think it really is important. Um, A lot of times in my book, I want to stress that we need to extend extend to ourselves um, compassion, Self compassion. Mm-hmm. We give compassion to everyone else, but we don't give ourselves compassion. And I think it's very important for us to give some compassion to ourselves. God gives us compassion, but we don't give it to ourselves. And we need to start doing that. Yeah. And we need to accept that we are enough just as we are because God loves us just as we are. I think, though, and I'm sure you've seen this and probably even felt it, is that how can we know that we that God loves us, that we are fine, that everything is good, and that we are in our own perfection in his eyes if we've never felt it in our lives? You know, I think that's huge because sometimes you have a lot of um, kids that are in violent homes or they're doing a lot of things and acting out and, and you're saying something something to them about love or uh, being fine and that they are perfect and they're good and they are cared for and they're loved. And they're saying, you must be talking a different language because I can't understand you. I can't receive it. It's because they have never felt it or they've never known it. Do you think that's a first step also? I think so, because, you know, I always say start with a simple thing. Every breath you take is a blessing. The fact that you are walking and talking is a blessing. You know, I was um, blessed. Well, I've been blessed so many ways. But, you know, when when I was shot in a drive-by shooting, um, I was not paralyzed. That was a blessing. It was like the hand of God stopped the bullet. The bullet came through the house, through the sofa, and it should have pierced my spine. It hit my back. It should have went through my body, but it did not. You could see that it you could see the the bullet on my back there was blood pouring down my down my shirt from where the bullet hit me. The paramedics showed up and they were like, "You should be paralyzed, you shouldn't be walking around. They patched me up. I went to my doctor. I had to walk with a cane and everything, but I should have been paralyzed, but I was not. The hand of God was on me, so the fact that I was still able to walk around was a miracle um And so, you know, I know that God exists. I know that the fact that I'm still able to walk around was indeed a miracle. 
I probably would have even died. <laughs> but the mm-hmm. fact that I wasn't paralyzed was a miracle because I was shot through a drive-by shooting, and I could look through the wall of the house with one eye open and see where the bullet came through the sofa, through the house, and hit me. Wow. And so I I know that God is real. I have lots of other stories I could tell, but your show is only for so long um, <laughs> about the miracles of God. And so um, I, I am a walking, talking miracle. I, I know that for a fact. I have tons of stories. <laughs> and so um, I know about the love of God. I know about the grace of God. I can give tons of testimonies. And when God is with you, you know it. And okay. his love is real. His grace is real. His mercy is real. And growing up in Compton, you know, I've been in various drive-by shootings where I've had to dive on the ground, you know, to keep from getting shot. And like I said, I was at Bible study, at a home Bible study, when I was hit by a bullet in the back. Wow. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was right. at a home Bible study. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. at a party. I wasn't. I wasn't doing anything bad. I was in Bible study <laughs> when mm-hmm. I got shot. Of that. <laughs> I was a fellow Christian. <laughs> yeah. And so you know, and God protected me. And so um, you know, when people want to know if God is real, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, a hundred percent, I know that I know that I know that I know that He is real. And that his love is real. And there's nothing anybody can tell me that he is not. And um, I know that heaven is real. I have other stories that I could tell at another time. A hundred percent for sure, for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, I can say that for fact, that that is real as well. Um, and so... Um, so if a child was to say, you know... Is God real? Every breath you take is a blessing because everybody doesn't get to take another breath. Some people went to sleep last night and didn't wake up this morning. So the fact that you're still living is a blessing. Your life may not be perfect and you may have problems, but your life will get better. You just have to keep living. You just have to keep trying and you just have to take it one step at a time, one day at a time. Your test will eventually become your testimony. You just have to give God time to work. And he will work. And somebody is watching him work on you and through you, for you, to you. Do you think, Dr. Tiffany, truly also, as you learn to find God's love, you also had to say, how can I see love among humans? Because... Does your mother love you or not love you? Hmm. You know, we think about a violence and abuse and the words and, and, you know, all of the things that come out and you're going, is that, that, but that's not love, but is that what you even have to take in? We think about love of our family and friends. We think about love. What does it really mean? Because we say, I haven't felt it, I don't know it. I see it in others, but, ooh, that doesn't really look like love. We see it in others when they twist and turn it into abuse. And we see love where people are coming and going and say, if you loved me, you wouldn't leave me. All of these things are all conditional aspects about love. Do you think sometimes that people will say, how do you really focus in to even know what it's about? (laughs) Yes. Love. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you've written a whole chap- chapters on there, you know. I mean, there's tons of pages. What is it? What is it about? Where does yeah. it take me? Do you think maybe yeah. what you wrote about is the process of experiencing what it is, what it isn't? Yes, yes. So it's I, I giggle because, you know, there's there's the romantic love, and then there's the family love, and then there's right. the community love, and then there's the Christian love. And so it kind of depends on which aspect of love you're talking about. There's the community love, and the community love comes from different family or different friends who become kind of like family. And I had a lot of support. That's the people who also helped my aunt 
who raised me, raised me. You know, those are the people who extended their homes to me and who lent a helping hand, who were my ad hoc mothers. And you never know how nice, how how um, that kind gesture goes, how far that kind gesture goes. You know, when you accept your child's friend into your home and you feed that child, you don't know how far that gesture goes. It really goes far because you don't know what that child is going through in their own home. And so make sure you do that with a loving heart. If that child is coming around a lot and wants to be at your house a lot and don't want to be at their own home, there's probably a reason why. Right. So even if you don't ask why, there's probably a reason why. So be kind to that child because that child is me. <laughs> and um... yeah. You know, it's so interesting you said that because I distinctly had a recollection of a memory the other day in which myself as a child, I was always, you know, you go out in the morning, they lock the door, you're not allowed back in until it's dark. And, um, and wasn't cared for in the daytime, so like I wasn't fed, or if it was cold or rainy, it didn't matter. But I would I would find myself trying to insert myself into other people in the area. Like I might go to my aunt's house and try to see if it was lunchtime, or go to a friend's house on Friday because I knew they always had a lunch on Fridays, and it was turkey sandwiches. And I never had turkey. I didn't know what it meant. When everybody sat down at the table, I'm going, oh, I never did this. And I always would find myself in those places to sense and feel things. Don't you think that that's what we do as humans? We put ourselves in positions to start to um, chip away and say there are other ways out there. There are kind people. Um, The world is not a hard place. And that you will find it, and eventually you will come to it? Absolutely. You start looking for that community love. And right. It, it exists. There are kind people out there, and you will seek them out. So that community love is essential. We are communal creatures, and we long for it, and we seek it out, and you are drawn to those people. And so that community love is there, and so you will look for it, and you will find it. And so that community love is, is, you know, those those poems are there for a reason, and it's reassuring, it's reaffirming, and you'll read those poems and you'll reflect back and you'll smile and you'll be like, oh, I remember those. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, those were good times. <laughs> and so there's that community love. And then there's, um, you know, family love. Like you said, you know, you think about your aunts and your uncles and your cousins and things like that. And so, um, and then there's the romantic love. The romantic love is that roller coaster love. It has its highs, its lows, its emotional. Um, it can be intense and, you know, it can kind of elate you, and it can deflate you. <laughs> yeah. It just, you know, it, it has, it, it, it's hot, it's cold. It can definitely yeah. take you on a severe roller coaster ride. And so um, it's it's a little bit of my sarcastic side. So it's the it's the jarring, the, the funny part of my poetic nature um <laughs> yeah because so it can also too try to suck the life out of you if if you know it becomes yeah. possessive if it becomes wrong if it becomes um overpowering it can take your life away yes 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 it can so yeah i have some some, some stories in there from myself and from some of my friends and so um th- that is the entertainment uh portion of my <laughs> poems <laughs> Let's talk, Dr. Tiffany, you talk about finding God because people will say, oh, but I hear that it's in church and everything and I get enough on Sunday, but they forget. Well, now in the time of Lent and people will say, but I gave up God or I gave up religion or, oh, I don't go to church anymore. And then they go about their merry way. But just as you and your work of bringing babies into the world, if there's no God, then where is the breath of life coming from? It's sort of you know like what's it didn't come from storks in the sky. You know what I mean? There's got to be a source of that. In other <laughs> words, do we believe in the spiritual essence of our soul, or do we believe it's just a human biological process? 
You know what's funny, Dr. Jeanette? I didn't grow up in church. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, right. uh, my family didn't didn't grow up in church, you know, um, and I didn't get a Bible till like, I was in, like, junior high. Um, I discovered God at a park when I was, like, in elementary school. Um, you know, a church was having an outreach, and I was playing on the playground, and um, there was a church having a mind ministry outreach, and they were performing to the song um, that the Winans has called Tomorrow. And it's, the lyrics go, Jesus said, let me in, and you said, I will tomorrow. And I, the lyrics spoke to me. And so I was like, oh, that looks interesting. And I started listening to the song. And then I asked one of my cousins if I could start going to church with her. And then I started going to church occasionally as I could with, you know, with her. And then that kind of started me on my road with Christ. Um, but, no, I never really started going to church. And then um, I joined, like, the Christian Fellowship Club at school in junior high. And then um, I started going to church with my cousin. And um, when I was volunteering with my church's mission, feeding the homeless in L.A., I decided I wanted to become a doctor. So I even decided to become a doctor while volunteering at church. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so yeah. that was kind of how I decided to even become a doctor by volunteering at church. Um, and so when I look back, God is how I ended up becoming a doctor. And um, if you say, you know, you don't, you're not really into this God stuff, you know, I look back at the pandemic and you look at how fragile life is. Right. And you see it, all these millions of people dying. Mm -hmm. And if you say, okay, if these people die, what happens to them when they die? Mm -hmm. Let's play devil's advocate. They die and their soul is gone. Okay. Let's say they die and they go to heaven. And God is like, okay, you're here. Why didn't you believe in me? Mm-hmm. Isn't it better to believe than to not believe? Mm-hmm. What does it hurt? Yeah. You know, I think also, to the time that the pandemic has showed us is is that we're not promised anything. You know, if you, we're not promised a perfect life and a long life. We're not promised that we will all graduate college. We will all have uh, great grandkids and, you know, there will always be a birthday cake on the table. We're not promised anything. All we're given is the breath of life. And God stands back and says, okay, show me. You know, show me how. I could graduate. Yeah. Yeah, show me how you can be with me and walk the earth. That's it. I mean, if we only would think of that as that's the only thing we have to do while we're here, then we'd go all of this other minutia that we've been collecting, holding on to, stories, memories, trinkets, um, collections in our closets, um, all of these friends, all these family members, all of these things that we're trying so desperately to hold on to, and, and and almost like giving up too much of ourself for it, we're kind of straying away from the mission. We're saying the human saga is more important to me and than to do what I was here to do. Because really in your book, Dr. Tiffany, really what you shared is that you had to lose some of those things. You had to lose your mother, okay, to her condition, how she chose to to leave the earth. You had to get a profession that you thought was right, but then you had to lose that too. But to say, okay, then it must be something next. Show me next. Show me next. Isn't that what God's asking of you? Absolutely. When I injured my hand and had to stop practicing uh, as an OBGYN, I was like, wait, Lord, um, I worked so hard and overcame so many obstacles to become a surgeon. You have Mm -hmm. got to be kidding me. What do you mean I can't be a surgeon anymore? This Mm -hmm. is not what we planned. This is not part of the plan. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. You've got to bring this back. Oh, no way. Mm -hmm. And so I was completely devastated. Um, I was just not there 
And so, you know, I really had to, you know, um, pray a lot. And, you know, I kind of lost myself for a minute. I was depressed for a while, and I had to uh, look within myself, um, and I began to write and uh, write my way out of it. And so that gave birth to fluetry. And so um, as I began to write the poems um, to write out, write my way out of it, I didn't write with the intent to publish a poetry book. Um, I wrote to write for me. Um, And so eventually, you know, I decided to share my poems with family and friends, and they were like, well, maybe your poems will help other people too. And so I said, okay. And so here I am, yeah, <laughs> trying you to know, encourage other people. Absolutely. I think truly what you're doing, Dr. Tiffany, is you're seeding others to help them open the door. We get so stuck inside of our own cage that we've created, especially by being, you know, this human. Once we put human word on there, then we've said, oh, dear, it's another existence that my soul's going through. So I think sometimes we say, oh, I, I got taken out or the life has gotten sucked out of me or I don't really know where I am and what's really going on. I think we turn around and we say, okay, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to stay in this moment, and I'm going to listen. And when you listen, you're listening for sounds, energy feelings, you're listening to your soul trying to find your spirit again. And really that's when the core starts. When you shut everything off, I mean, like when you had all of these issues and obstacles in your life, you had to stop at one point and say, I'm done, okay, I have all this time now, keep speaking, and I'm going to sit every day until you speak to me. Isn't that what we're asking? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, sometimes you just have to say, Okay, and I really believe that right now God still speaks. We really just have to listen and hear, um, let our spiritual ear and our spiritual eye, you know, take over. You know, a lot of times we listen with our worldly ear and our worldly eye, and we just really need to open, be open to our spiritual side. I think sometimes we say um, we believe we have, there's a right way, a wrong way. And, you know, as humans, we weren't given a book to be able to figure out how to do it. So now we're kind of working ourselves out of what we've created over the eons. It's almost as if there was a switch that flipped and it says, if you look back in our, our decade, you know, in the 80s, everybody was going to college. It was a new thing. The 90s, everybody wanted a perfect body. They were going to plastic surgeons, you know. After 2000, everybody had to have two, three, and home, four homes and cars and everything, you know, and all these cell phones and stuff. Now we're looking at the year 2022, and it says, minimalist. I don't need all of that stuff. How can I clear things out of my life and make it so much easier so I can hear. I don't have so much static in my life because I'm missing something. Do you think that perhaps your book, Flowetry, is about saying, let's bring up the noise. And when we bring up the noise, we say, ah, that's the noise that I can let go. That's the story that I can let go. That's the way it was before, but it doesn't have to be. I can recreate something new. Isn't your book about how do you create beyond the human experience? I think so. I really do. I think it's about looking within yourself Mm -hmm. and listening to yourself and trying to also hear what God has for you. And, you know, I really believe that God speaks through action as well as inaction. And we just need to be able to hear what he is trying to say to us. Yeah. There's so much noise these days. It's it's if you could ever just shut it off, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Tiffany, it was such a pleasure to have you with us today because I think your story is truly about the human story, but it's also about the soul wanting to be able to speak and to say, I we got this. Because you know what? You and I are still here. So 
So obviously we still have something to share, something to learn, something to be inspired by, and something to seek. And that's what the human time is about. So I think that your book says, yes, this is all what it's, I've been through. Let's keep going. What's new coming on the pike, right? Absolutely. I agree so, completely. So we have another book from you, Dr. Tiffany, coming up soon about transformation maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always working and always writing. Oh, that's wonderful. Can you share with the listeners how to find out more information about your work? You can find out more information from me on Instagram at Dr. Tiffany Take More. Very good. Well, it was such a pleasure to have you with us here today. I think that um, it's just a joy to be able to engage and with others that are able to say, you know, it's going to be okay. We've been through this, that, and the other. We share our stories and we inspire. And many people are at the point that they need to have someone say, can you come sit with me by my door and help me open the window? And that's what your poems do. So we thank you so much for sharing that today. Thank you very much for having me. It has truly been my pleasure. Thank you. If you'd like to find out more information about Dr. Tiffany Tate Moore, again, the book is Flowetry, a collection of 108 poetic flows on life, love, and liturgical issues. Please do click on the link on the bottom of today's show page. Go directly to her website for more information. And it truly is to say it's going to be okay. Extend your hand, open your heart, clear your mind, and just sit for a moment. Close your eyes, be at peace, and just say, I'm going to listen. I'm going to hear. First thing you will hear is your own heartbeat. And you will definitely hear the wind blowing by. Start there. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Until tomorrow, have a great day. Today we discuss many life-changing concepts. Who do you turn to and how do you know what is best when faced with a health crisis? Dr. Jeanette is a patient advocate. She listens to the patient, the doctors, and the family, clarifies the health issues and concerns, then helps the patient make the best choices going forward. If you would like help implementing change into your life and health, we can talk and see where you are stuck and how to improve the quality of your life. Check the link on the bottom of today's show page or visit drjeanettegallagher.com to schedule a phone appointment today.